Howdy, my name is Sean Martinez, and today I will be reading Griffin, a short story by Charles Baxter. Now, some cultural context. One of the key elements is, in this story is a character's use of a deck of tarot cards to predict the future. Originating more than 500 years ago in northern Italy in a game called Triumphs, the tarot was quickly adopted as a tool for divining the future. With deep roots in the symbolism of medieval and renaissance Europe, the tarot is today the singular most popular tool for spiritual introspection and prophecy. While the death card in particular is often feared, many interpreters argue that it hardly ever points to literal death, but rather symbolizes the ending of something significant and the beginning of something new. In Griffin, the accuracy of the tarot's prediction is less important than various characters' reactions to it. Griffin On Wednesday afternoon, between the geography lesson on ancient Egypt's hand-operated irrigation system and an art project that involved drawing a model, a city, next to a mountain, our fourth grade teacher, Mr. Hibbler, developed a cough. This cough began with a series of muffled throat clearings and progressed to propulsive noises contained within Mr. Hibbler's closed mouth. Listen to him, Carol Peterson whispered to me. He's gonna blow up! Mr. Hibbler's laughter, dazed and infrequent, sounded a bit like his cough, but as we worked on our model cities, we would look up, thinking he was enjoying a joke and see Mr. Hibbler's face turning red, his cheeks puffed out. This was not laughter. Twice he bent over, and his loose tie, like a plumb line, hung down straight from his neck as he exploded himself into a Kleenex. He would excuse himself, then go on coughing. I'll bet you a dime, Carol Peterson whispered. We get a substitution tomorrow. Carol sat at a desk in front of mine, and was a bad person. When she thought no one was looking, she would blow her nose on notebook, notebook paper, then crumble it up and throw it into the waste basket. But at times of crisis, she spoke the truth. I knew I'd lose the dime. No deal, I said. When Mr. Hibbler stood, up, stood us up in formation at the door just prior to the final bell, he was almost incapable of speech. <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> boys and girls, <coughs> he said. I, <coughs> I seem <coughs> to be <coughs> coming down <coughs> with something. I hope you feel better tomorrow, Mr. Hibbler, Bobby Krasansowicz said. Uh, the faultless brown noser, and I heard Carol Peterson's evil giggle. Then Mr. Hibbler opened the door, and we walked out to the buses. A click of us, starting noisily to hawk and cough as soon as we thought we were a few feet beyond Mr. Hibbler's earshot. Five Oaks was a rural community, and in Michigan, the supply of substitute teachers was limited to the town's unemployment community college graduates a pool of about four mothers. These ladies provided easeful, these ladies fluttered, uh, provided easeful class days, and nervously covered material we had mastered three weeks earlier. Therefore, it was a surprise when a woman we had never seen came into the class next day, carrying a purple purse, a checkerboard lunchbox, and a few books. She put the books on one side of Mr. Hibbler's desk, and the lunchbox on the other, next to the Voice of Music phonograph. Three of us in the back of the room were playing with Heaver, the chameleon that lived in the terrarium and on one of the plastic drapes, when she walked in. She clapped her hands at us. Little boys, she said. Why are you bent over together like that? She didn't wait for us to answer. Are you tormenting an animal? Put it back. Please sit down at your desks. I want no cabals this time of the day. We just stared at her. Boys, she repeated. I asked you to sit down. 
I put the chameleon in his terrarium and felt my way to my desk, never taking my eyes off the woman. With white and green chalk, she had started to draw a tree on the left side of the blackboard. She didn't look usual. Furthermore, her tree was outsized, uh, disproportionate for some reason. This room needs a tree, she said, with one line drawing the suggestion of a leaf. A large, leafy, shady, deciduous oak. Her fine, light hair had been done up in what I would learn years later was called a chignon, and she wore gold-trimmed glasses, whose lenses seemed to have the faintest blue tint. Harold uh, Nardal, who sat across from me, whispered, Mars, and I nodded slowly, savoring the eminent weirdness of the day. The substitute drew another branch with an extravagant arm gesture, then turned around and said, Good morning. I don't believe I said good morning to all of you yet. Facing us, she was no special age. An adult is an adult. But her face had two prominent lines, descending vertically from the sides of her mouth to her chin. I knew where I had seen those lines before. Pinocchio. They were marionette lines. You may stare at me, she said to us, as a few more kids from the last bus came into the room, their eyes fixed on her. For a few more seconds until the bell rings. Then I will permit no more staring. Looking, I will permit. Staring, no. It is impolite to stare, and a sign of bad breeding. You cannot make a social effort while staring. Harold Nardal did not glance at me or nudge, but I heard him whisper, Mars, again, trying to get more mileage out of his single joke with the kids who had just come in. When everyone was seated, the substitute teacher finished her tree, put down her chalk fastidiously on the phonograph, and brushed her hands and faced us. Good morning, she said. I am Miss Ferenzi, your teacher for the day. I am fairly new to your community, and I don't believe any of you know me. I will therefore start by telling you a story about myself. We settled back. While, pardon me, while we settled back, she launched into her tale. She said her grandfather had been a Hungarian prince, her mother had been born in some place called Flanders, had been a pianist, and had played concerts for people Miss Ferenzi referred to as crowned heads. She gave us a knowing look. Grieg, she said, the Norwegian master wrote a concerto for piano that was, she paused, my mother's triumph at her debut concert in London. Her eyes searched the ceiling. Our eyes followed. Nothing up there but ceiling tile. For reasons that I shall not go into, my family's fortunes took us to Detroit, then north to dreadful Sang uh, Saginaw, and now here I am in Five Oaks as your substitute teacher for today, Thursday, October the 11th. I believe it will be a good day. All the forecasts coincide. We shall start with your reading lesson. Take your reading book. I believe it is called Broad Horizons or something along those lines. Uh, Jeannie uh, Vermish raised her hand. Miss Frenzy nodded at her. Uh, Mr. Hebler always starts the day with the Pledge of Allegiance, Jeannie whined. Does he? In that case, Miss Frenzy said, you must know it very well by now, and we certainly need not spend our time on it. No, no, no allegiance pledging on the premises today, by my reckoning. Not, so, not with so much sunlight coming into the room. A pledge does not suit my mood, she glanced at her watch. She glanced at her watch. Time is flying. Take out broad horizons. She disappointed us by giving us an ordinary lesson, complete with vocabulary word drills, uh, comprehension questions, and recitation. She didn't seem to care for the material, however. She sighed every few minutes and rubbed her glasses with a frilly, perfumed handkerchief, 
uh, that she withdrew, magician-style, from her left sleeve. After reading, we moved on to arithmetic. It was my favorite time of the morning, when the lazy autumn sunlight dazzled its way through the ribbons of clouds past the windows on the east side of the classroom, and crept across the linoleum floor. On the playground, the first group of children, the kindergartners, were running on the quack grass beyond the monkey bars. We were doing multiplication tables. Miss Ferenzi had made John Wasney uh, stand up at his desk in the front row. He was supposed to go through the tables of six. From where I was sitting, I could smell the vitalis soaked into John's plastered hair. He was doing fine until he came to six times eleven and six times twelve. Six times eleven, he said, is sixty-eight. Uh, six times twelve is... He put his f fingers to his head, quickly and secretly sniffed his fingertips, and said, uh, Seventy-two. Then he sat down. Fine, Miss Ferenzi said. Well, now, that was very good. Uh, Miss Ferenzi, one of the Eddie twins was waving her hand desperately in the air. Uh, Miss Ferenzi, Miss Ferenzi. Yes? John said that six times eleven is sixty-eight, and you said he was right. Did I? She gazed at the class with a jolly look breaking across her marionette's face. Did I say that? Well, what is six times eleven? It's sixty-six. She nodded. Yes, so it is. But, and I know some people will not entirely agree with me, at some times it is sixty-eight. When? When is it sixty-eight? We were all waiting. In higher mathematics, which you children do not yet understand, six times eleven can be considered to be eighty-eight. Pardon me, sixty-eight. She laughed through her nose. <laughs> In higher mathematics, numbers are more fluid. The only thing a number does is measure a certain amount of something. Think of water. A cup is not the only way to measure a certain amount of water, is it? We were staring, shaking our heads. You could use saucepans or thimbles. In either case, the water would be the same. Perhaps, she started again, it would be better for you to think that six times eleven is sixty-eight only when I am in the room. Why is it sixty-eight? Mark Poole asked, when you're in the room. Because it's interesting that way, she said, smiling, her, smiling very rapidly behind her blue-tinted glasses. Besides, I'm your substitute teacher, am I not? We all nodded. Well, then, think of six times eleven equals thirty-six as a substitute fact. A substitute fact? Yes, she looked at us carefully. Do you think, she asked, that anyone is going to be hurt by a substitute fact? We looked back at her. Will the plants on the window sills be hurt? We glanced at them. They were sensitive plants, thriving in a green plastic tray, and several wilted ferns in small clay pots. Your dogs and cats, or your moms and dads, she waited. So, she concluded, what's the problem? But, but it's wrong, Janice Weber said, isn't it? And what's your name, young lady? Janice Weber. And you think it's wrong, Janice? I was just asking. Well, all right. You were just asking. I think we've spent enough time on this matter by now, don't you, class? You are free to think what you like. When your teacher, Mr. Hibbler, returns, six times eleven will be sixty-six again. You can rest assured. And it will be that for the rest of your lives in Five Oaks. Too bad, huh? She raised her eyebrows and glinted herself at us. But for now, it wasn't. So much for that. 
Let us go to your assigned problems for today, as painstakingly outlined, I see, in Mr. Hibbler's lesson plan. Take out a sheet of paper and write your names in the upper left-hand corner. For the next hour, we did the rest of our arithmetic problems. We handed them in and went on to spelling, my worst subject. Spelling always came before lunch. We were taking spelling dictation and looking at the clock. Thorough, Miss Ferenzi said. Boundary. She walked in the aisles between the desks, holding the spelling book open and looking down at her papers. Balcony? I clutched my pencil. Somehow, the way she said those words, see, they seemed foreign. Uh, Hungarian, misvowled, misconsonanted. I stared down at what I had spelled. Balcony. I turned my pencil upside down and erased my mistake. Balcony. That looked better, but, but still incorrect. I cursed the world of spelling and tried erasing it again and saw the paper beginning to wear away. Balcony. Suddenly, I felt a hand on my shoulder. I don't like that word either, Miss Frenzy whispered, bent over, her mouth near my ear. It's ugly. My feeling is, if you don't like a word, you don't have to use it. She straightened up, leaving behind a slight odor of clarets. At lunchtime, we went out to get our trays of sloppy joes, peaches and heavy syrup, coconut cookies and milk, and brought them back to the classroom, where Miss Frenzy was sitting at the desk, eating a brown sticky thing she had unwrapped from tightly, from tightly rubber-banded wax papers. Uh, Miss Frenzy, I said, raising my hand, you don't have to eat with us. You can eat with the other teachers. There's a teacher's lounge, I ended up, next to the principal's office. No, thank you, she said. I prefer it here. We've got a classroom monitor, I said. Uh, Mrs. Eddy. I pointed to where Mrs. Eddy, Joyce and Judy's mother, sat silently at the back of the room, during doing her, knit, doing her knitting. That's fine, Miss Frenzy said. But I shall continue to eat here, with you children. I prefer it, she repeated. Uh, how come? Wayne Rasmer asked without raising his hand. I talked with the other children before, pardon me, with the other teachers before class this morning, uh, Miss Renzi said, biting into her brown food. There was a great rattling of words for the fewness of ideas. I didn't care for their brand of hilarity. I don't like ditto machine jokes. Oh, Wayne said. What's that you're eating? Maxine Sylvester asked, twitching her nose. Is it food? It most certainly is food. It's a stuffed fig. I had to drive almost down to Detroit to get it. I also brought some smoked sturgeon. And this she said, lifting some green leaves out of her lunchbox, is raw spinach, cleaned this morning before I came out here to the Garfield Murray School. Why are you eating raw spinach? Maxine asked. It's good for you, Miss Frenzy said, more stimulating than soda pop or smelling stalls. I bit into my sloppy joe and stared blankly out the window. An almost invisible moon was faintly silvered in the daytime autumn sky. As far as food is concerned, Miss Frenzy was saying, you have to shuffle the pack, mix it up. Too many people eat... well, never mind. Miss Frenzy, Carol Peterson asked, what are we going to do this afternoon? Well, she said, looking down at Mr. Hibbler's lesson plan, I see that your teacher, Mr. Hibbler, has you scheduled for a unit on the Egyptians. Carol groaned. Yes, Miss Frenzy continued. This is what we will do. The Egyptians. A remarkable people. Almost as remarkable as the Americans. But not quite. She lowered her head, did her quick smile, and went back to eating her spinach. 
After a noon recess, we came back into the classroom and saw that Miss Ferenzi had drawn a pyramid on the blackboard, close to her oak tree. Some of us who had been playing baseball were messing around in the back of the room, uh, dropping the bats and the gloves into the playground box, and I think Ray uh, Schantzettler had just slugged me when I heard Miss Ferenzi's high-pitched voice quavering with emotion. Boys, she said, come to order right this minute and take your seats. I do not wish to waste a minute of class time. Take out your geography books. We trudged to our desks and, still sweating, pulled out distant lands and their people. Turn to page 42. She waited for 30 seconds, then looked over at Kelly Munger. Young man, she said, why are you still fossicking in your desk? Kelly looked as if his foot had been stepped on. Why am I doing what? Why are you burrowing in your desk like that? I'm looking for the book, Miss Ferenzi. Uh, Bobby Krasanowicz, the faultless brown noser who sat in the first row by choice, softly said, His name is Kelly Munger. He can't ever find his stuff. He always does that. I don't care what his name is, especially after lunch, Miss Ferenzi said. Where is your book? I just found it. Kelly was peering into his desk and with both hands pulled at the book, shoveling along in front of it several pencils and crayons which fell into his lap and then into the floor. I hate a mess, Miss Frenzy said. I hate a mess in a desk or a mind. It's unsanitary. You wouldn't want your home to look like your desk at school, now would you? Uh, she didn't wait for an answer. I think not. A house at home should be a, as neat as human hands can make it. What were we talking about? Egypt. Page 42. I note from Mr. Hibbler's lesson plan that you have been discussing the modes of Egyptian irrigation. Interesting, in my view, but not so interesting as what we are about to cover. The pyramids and Egyptian slave labor. A plus on one side, a minus on the other. We had our books open to page 42, where there was a picture of a pyramid. But Mrs. Uh, but Miss Ferenzi wasn't looking at the book. Instead, she was staring at some object just outside the window. Pyramids, Miss Ferenzi said, still looking past the window. I want you to think about the pyramids, and what was inside. The bodies of the pharaohs, of course, and their attendant treasures. Scrolls, perhaps, Miss Ferenzi said, with something gleeful but unsmiling in her face. These scrolls were novels for the pharaohs, helping them to pass the time in their long voyage through the centuries. But then, I am joking. I was looking at the lines on Miss Ferenzi's face. Pyramids, Miss Ferenzi went on were the repositories of special cosmic forces. The nature of a pyramid is to guide cosmic energy forces into a concentrated point. The Egyptians knew that. We have generally forgotten it. Did you know, she asked, walking to the side of the room so that she was standing by the coat closet, that George Washington had Egyptian blood from his grandmother? Certain features of the Constitution of the United States are notable for their Egyptian ideas. Without glancing down at the book, she began to talk about the movement of souls in Egyptian religion. She said that when people die, their souls return to earth in the form of carpenter ants or walnut trees, depending on how they behaved. Well or ill in life. She said that Egyptians believe that people act the way they do because of magnetism produced by tidal forces in the solar system, forces produced by the sun and by its planetary ally, Jupiter. Jupiter, she said, was a planet, as we have been told, but had certain properties of stars. She was speaking very fast. She said that the Egyptians were great explorers and conquerors. She said that the greatest of all the conquerors, Genghis Khan, 
had had forty horses and forty young women killed on the side of his grave. We listened. No one tried to stop her. I myself may have, I myself have been in Egypt, she said, and have witnessed much, much dust and many brutalities. She said that an old man in Egypt, who had worked for a circus, had personally shown her an animal in a cage, a monster, half bird, half lion. She said that this monster was called a griffin, and that she had heard about them, but had never seen them until she traveled to the outskirts of Cairo. She said that Egyptian astronomers had discovered the, the planet Saturn, but had not seen its rings. She said that the Egyptians were that the Egyptians were the first to discover that dogs, when they are ill, will not drink from rivers, but wait for rain, and hold their jaws open to catch it. She lies. We were on the school bus home. I was sitting next to Carl Whiteside, who had bad breath and a huge collection of marbles. We were arguing. Carl thought she was lying. I said she wasn't, probably. I didn't believe that stuff about the bird, Carl said. And what she told us about the pyramids? I didn't believe that either. She didn't know what she was talking about. Oh, yeah? I had liked her. She was strange. I thought I could nail him. If she was lying, I said, what'd she say that was a lie? Six times eleven isn't sixty-eight. It isn't ever. It's sixty-six. I know for a fact. She said so. She admitted it. What else did she lie about? I don't know, he said. Stuff. What stuff? Well, he swung his legs back and forth. You ever seen an animal that was half lion, half bird? He crossed his arms. It sounds real fakey to me. It could happen, I said. I had to improvise, to outrage him. I read in this newspaper my mom bought in the IGA about this scientist, this mad scientist in the Swiss Alps, and he's been putting genes and chromosomes and stuff together in test tubes, and he combined a human being and a hamster. I waited for effect. It's called a humster. You never... Carl was staring at me, his mouth wide open, his terrible bad breath making its way toward me. What newspaper was it? The National Enquirer, I said, that they sell next to the cash registers. When I saw his look of recognition, I knew I had bested him. And this mad scientist, I said, his name was um, Dr. Frankenbush. I realized belatedly that this name was a mistake, and waited for Carl to notice its resemblance to the name of the other famous ma master of per permutations, but he only sat there. A man in a hamster. He was staring at me, squinting, his mouth open in distaste. Jeez, what it looked like. When the bus reached my stop, I took off down our dirt road and ran up through the backyard, kicking the tire swing for good luck. I dropped my books on the back steps so I could hug and kiss our dog, Mr. Selby. Then I hurried inside. I could smell Brussels sprouts cooking, my unfavored vegetable. My mother was watching, washing other vegetables in the kitchen sink, and my baby brother was hollering in his yellow playpen on the kitchen floor. Hi, Mom, I said, hopping around the playpen to kiss her. Guess what? I have no idea. We had this substitute today, Miss Frenzy, and I'd never seen her before, and she had all these stories and ideas and stuff. Uh, well, that's good. My mother looked out the window behind the sink, her eyes on the pine woods west of her house. Her face and hairstyle always reminded other people of Betty Crocker whose picture was framed inside a gigantic spoon on the side of the biscuit box. To me, though, my mother's face just looked white. Listen, Tommy, she said. Go upstairs and pick your clothes off the bathroom floor, then go outside to the shed and put the shovel and axe away that your father left outside this morning. 
She said that six times eleven was sometimes sixty-eight, I said. And she said that she saw a monster, she once saw a monster that was half lion and half bird. I waited. In Egypt, she said. Did you hear me? My mother asked, raising her arms to wipe her forehead with the back of her hand. You have chores to do. I know, I said. I was just telling you about the substitute. It's very interesting, my mother said, quickly glancing down at me, and we can talk about it later when your father gets home. But right now you have some work to do. <laughs> okay, Mom. I took a cookie out of the jar on the counter and was about to go outside when I had a thought. I ran into the living room, pulled out a dictionary next to the TV stand, and opened it to the G's. Griffin. Variant of Griffin. Griffin, a fabulous beast with the head and wings of an eagle and the body of a lion. Fabulous was right. I shouted with triumph and ran outside to put my father's tools back in their place. Miss Frenzy was back the next day, slightly altered. She had pulled her hair down and twisted it into pigtails, with red rubber bands holding them tight one inch from the ends. She was wearing a green blouse and pink scarf, making her difficult to look at for a full class day. This time there was no pretense of doing a reading lesson or moving on to arithmetic. As soon as the bell rang, she simply began to talk. She talked for forty minutes straight. There seemed to be less connection between her ideas, but the ideas themselves were, as the dictionary would say, fabulous. She said she heard of a huge jewel in what she called the Antipodes, that was so brilliant that when the light shone onto it in a certain angle, it would blind whoever was looking at its center. She said that the biggest diamond in the world was the was cursed, and had killed everyone who owned it, and that by a trick of fate it was called the Hope Diamond. Diamonds are magic, she said, and this is why women wear them on their fingers, as a sign of the magic of womanhood. Men have strength, Miss Ferenzi said, but no true magic. That is why men fall in love with women, but women do not fall in love with men. They just love being loved. George Washington had died because of a mistake he made about a diamond. Washington was not the first true president, but she did not say who was. In some places of the world, she said, men and women still live in the trees and eat monkeys for breakfast. Their doctors are magicians. At the bottom of the sea are creatures thin as pancakes, which have never been studied by scientists, because when you take them up into the air, the fish explode. There was not a sound in the classroom, except for Miss Ferenzi's voice and Donna DeShano's coughing. Not even one went to the bathroom. Beethoven, she said, had not been deaf. It was a trick to make himself famous, and it worked. As she talked, Miss Ferenzi's pigtail swung back and forth. There are trees in the world, she said, that eat meat. Their leaves are sticky and close up on bugs like hands. She lifted her hands and brought them together, palm to palm. Venus, which most people think is the next closest planet to the sun, is not always closer. And beside, besides, pardon, it is the planet of greatest mystery because of its thick cloud cover. I know what lies behind underneath, pardon me, I know what lies underneath those clouds, Miss Ferenzi said and waited. After the silence, she said, angels, angels live under those clouds. She said that the angels were not invisible to everyone and in fact smarter than most people. They did not dress in robes, as was often claimed, but instead wore formal evening clothes, as if they were about to attend a concert. Often, angels do attend concerts. It's in the aisles where, she said, most people pay no attention to them. She said the most terrible angel had the shape of the Sphinx. There is no running away from that one, she said. She said that unquenchable fires burn just under the surface of the earth in Ohio. And that, and that the baby Mozart fainted dead away in his cradle when he first heard the sound of a trumpet. 
She said that someone named Narzim al-Haradim was the greatest writer who ever lived. She said that the planets control behavior, and anyone conceived during a solar eclipse would be born with webbed feet. I know you children like to hear these things, she said, these secrets, and that is why I am telling you all this. We nodded. It was better than doing comprehension questions for the readings in Broad Horizon. I will tell you one more story, she said, and then we will have to do arithmetic. She leaned over, and her voice grew soft. There is no death, she said. You must never be afraid. Never. That which is cannot die. It will change into different earthly and unearthly elements. But I know this is as sure as I stand here in front of you, and I swear it, you must not be afraid. I have seen this truth with these eyes. I know it, because in a dream God kissed me. Here, and she pointed with her right index finger to the side of her head below the mouth, where the vertical lines were carved into her skin. Absent-mindedly, we all did our arithmetic problems. At recess, the class was out on the playground, but no one was playing. We were all standing in small groups, talking about Miss Frenzy. We didn't know if she was crazy or, or what. I looked out beyond the playground at the rusted cars piled in a small heap behind a clump of sumac and wanted to see shapes there, approaching me. On the way home, Carl sat next to me again. He didn't say much, and I didn't either. At last he turned to me. You know what she said about the leaves that, that close up on bugs? Huh? The, the leaves, Carl insisted. The meat-eating plants. I know it's true. I saw it on television. The leaves have this, this sticky glue that the plants have got smeared all over them, and the insects can't get off, because they're suck. stuck. pardon. I saw it. He seemed demoralized. She's telling the truth. Yeah. You think she's seen all those angels? I shrugged. I don't think she has, Carl informed me. I think she just made that part up. There's a tree, I suddenly said. I was looking out the window at the farms along Country Road H. I knew every barn, every broken windmill, every fence, every uh, anhydrous ammonia tank by heart. There's a tree that's... that I've seen... Don't you do it, Carl said. You'll just sound like a jerk. I kissed my mother. She was standing in front of the stove. How was your day? She asked. Fine. Did you have Miss Frenzy again? Yeah. Well? She was fine, Mom. I asked, can I go to, can I go to my room? No, she said. Not until you've gone out to the vegetable garden and picked me a few tomatoes. She glanced at the sky. I think it's going to rain. Skedaddle and do it now. Then you can come back inside and watch your brother for a few minutes while I go upstairs. I need to clean up before dinner. She looked down at me. You're looking a little pale, Tommy. She touched the back of her hand to my forehead, and I felt her diamond ring against my skin. Do you feel all right? I'm... I'm fine, I said, and went out to pick the tomatoes. Coughing mutedly, Mr. Hibbler was back the next day, slipping lozenges into his mouth when his back was turned at 45 minutes in 45 minute intervals, and asking us how much of the prepared lesson plan Miss Frenzy had followed. Edith Atwater took the responsibility for the class of explaining to Mr. Hibbler that the substitute hadn't always done exactly what he would have done, but we had worked hard, even though she talked a lot. About what? he asked. All kinds of things, Edith said. 
I sort of forgot. To our relief, Mr. Hibbler seemed not at all interested in what, Mrs. what Miss Frenzy had said to fill the day. He probably thought it was a woman's talk. Unserious and not suited for school. It was enough that he had a pile of arithmetic problems for us to correct. For the next month, the sumac turned a distracting red in the field, and the sun traveled toward the southern sky so that its rays reached Mr. Hibbler's Halloween display on the bulletin board in the back of the room, fading the scarecrow with a pumpkin head from orange to tan. Every three days, I measured how much farther the sun had moved towards the southern horizon by making small marks with my black crayola on the north wall, ant-sized marks only I knew were there inching west. Then in early December, four days after the first permanent snowfall, she appeared again in our classroom. The minute she came in the door, I felt my heart begin to pound. Once again, she was different. This time, her hair hung straight down and seemed to have been combed. She hadn't brought her lunch box with her, but she was carrying what seemed to be a small box. She greeted all of us and talked about the weather. Donna DeShano had to remind her to take her overcoat off. When the bell to start the day finally rang, Miss Frenzy looked out at all of us and said, Children, I have enjoyed your company in the past, and today I am going to reward you. She held up the small box. Do you know what this is? She waited. Of course you don't. It's a tarot pack. Edith, Atwater, raised her hand. What's a tarot pack, Miss Ferenzi? It is used to tell fortunes, she said. And that is what I shall do this morning. I shall tell you your fortunes, as I have been taught to do. What's fortune? Bobby Krasanowicz asked. The future, young man. I shall tell you what your future will be. I can't do your whole future, of course. I shall have to limit myself to the five-card system. The wands, cups, swords, pentacles, and the higher arcanes. Now, who wants to be first? There was a long silence. Then Carol Peterson raised her hand. All right. Miss Ferenzi said. She divided the pack into five smaller packs and walked back to Carol's desk in front of mine. Pick one card from each of these packs, she said. I saw that Carol had a four of cups, a six of swords, but I couldn't see the other cards. Miss Ferenzi studied the cards on Carol's desk for a minute. Not bad, she said. I do not see much higher education. Probably an early marriage. Many children. There's something bleak and dreary here, but I can't tell what. Perhaps just the tasks of a housewife life. I think you'll do very well, for the most part. She smiled at Carol with a smile, a smile with a certain lack of interest. Who wants to be next? Carol, uh, pardon me, Carl... Whiteside raised his hand slowly. Yes, Miss Ferenzi said. Let's do a boy. She walked over to where Carl sat. After he picked his five cards, she gazed at them for a long time. Travel, she said. Much distant travel. You might go into the army. Not too much romantic interest here. A late marriage, if at all. Squabbles. But the sun is in your major arcana here. Yes, that's a very good card, she giggled. <laughs> Maybe a good life. Now I raised my hand, and she told me my future. She did the same with Bobby Krasanowicz, Kelly Munger, Edith Atwater, and Kim Four. Then she came to Wayne Rasmer. She picked his five cards, and I could see that the death card was one of them. What's your name? Miss Ferenzi asked. Wayne. 
Well, Wayne, she said, you will undergo a great metamorphosis, the greatest, before you become an adult. Your earthly elements will leap away into thin air, you sweet boy. This card, this, this nine of swords here, tells of suffering and desolation. And this ten of wands, well, that's a heavy load. What, what about this one? Wayne pointed it to the death card. That one? Oh, that means you will, that one means you will die soon, my dear. She gathered up the cards. We were all looking at Wayne. But do not fear. It's not really death. So much as change. She put the cards on Mr. Hibbler's desk. And now, let's do some arithmetic. At lunchtime, Wayne went to, to, went to Mr. Fager, the principal, and told him what Miss Ferenzi had done. During the noon recess, we saw Miss Ferenzi drive out of the parking lot in her green rambler. I stood under the slide, listening to the other kids coasting down and landing in the little depressive bowl at the bottom. I was kicking stones and tugging at my hair, right up to the moment when I saw Wayne come out to the playground. He smiled, the dead fool, and with the fingers of his right hand he was showing everyone how he had told on Miss Ferenzi. I made my way toward Wayne, pushing myself past two girls from another class. He was watching me with his little pinhead eyes. You told, I shouted at him. She was just kidding. She shouldn't have, he shouted back. We were supposed to be doing arithmetic. She just scared you, I said. You're a chicken. You're a chicken, Wayne. You are. Scared of a little card, I sing-songed. Wayne fell at me, his two fists hammering down on my nose. I gave him a good one in the stomach and then tried for his head. Aiming my fist, I saw that he was crying. I slugged him. She was right, I yelled. She was always right. She told the truth. Other kids were whooping. You were just scared, that's all. And then large hands pulled at us, and it was my turn to speak to Mr. Faker. In the afternoon, Miss Ferenzi was gone, and my nose was stuffed with cotton, clotted with blood. And my lip had swelled. And our class had been combined with Mrs. Mante's sixth grade class for a crowded afternoon science unit on insect life in ditches and swamps. I knew where Mrs. Mante lived. She had a new house trailer down the road from us, at the Clearwater Park. She was no mystery. Somehow, she and Mr. Bodine, the other fourth-grade teacher, had managed to fit forty-five desks into the room. Kelly Munger asked if Miss Ferenzi had been arrested, and Mrs. Mante said no, of course not. All that afternoon, until the buses came to pick us up, we learned about field crickets two striped grasshoppers, and water bugs, and cicadas, mosquitoes, flies, moths. We learned about insects' hard outer shell, the exoskeleton, and the usual parts of the mouth, including the labrum, mandible, maxilla, and glossa. We learned about compound eyes, and the four-stage metamorphosis from egg to larva to pupa to adult. We learned something, not much, about mating. Mrs. Mante drew, very skillfully, the internal anatomy of the grasshopper on the blackboard. We learned about the dances of the honeybee, directing other bees in the hive to pollen. We learned about which insects were pests to man, and which were not. On lined, white pieces of paper, we made lists of insects we might actually see and a list of insects too small to be clearly visible, such as fleas. Mrs. Mante said that our assignment would be to memorize these lists for the next day, when Mr. Hibbler would certainly return and test us on our knowledge. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, if you found this useful, please do like, and of course, please do subscribe.